Thank you for joining us online. At Mission Gathering, we welcome all to Christ's table. If you are Asian, Hispanic, Black, or White, if you are male or female, trans or non-binary, if you are three days old, 30 years old, or 103 years old, if you've never stepped foot in a church, or if you are Buddhist, Roman Catholic, agnostic, or a lifelong evangelical, if you are single, married, divorced, separated, or partnered, if you are straight, gay, lesbian, or bisexual, if you are a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, a Socialist, or not registered to vote, if you have or have had addictions, phobias, abortions, or a criminal record, if you own your own home, or rent, live with your parents, or are homeless, if you are fully able, disabled, or a person of differing abilities, you are welcome here. Does it ever feel like something's really wrong with religion in this country? If you've been watching the news this past week, you've seen people storming the Capitol over and over and over again. Or if you watched the Super Bowl, you saw how Jeep tried to make an ad that called for peace and to come to the middle by using symbols of white Christian nationalism. In all of this debate and all of the things that are going on and all of the scandals after scandals of celebrity pastors is enough to make any person who's really committed to, to being a part of the church or who spent their whole life going to the church to question, can any of this even really bring us peace? Can any of this ever really make a difference in the world? And I get that and I feel that. But today's story from Mark is filled with mysteries that points to a bigger reality, a greater something that is beyond what we see in the religious institutions of today. So if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're burnt out on religion, join us this morning or whenever you're watching as we explore the wisdoms and the truths of the gospel with an air of openness and inclusion that just might be the secret to reaching peace. Say 
Oh, hello there. Did you know today's Valentine's Day? Valentine's is one of those times of the year where we like to get cards, chocolates, or small gifts for those that we love and care about. At Mission Gathering, we use 100% of your gifts to support all of the things going on here. And this weekend, we have some exciting news. We have three new nonprofits moving into our building. Your gifts help us to sustain and maintain this building so that nonprofits that work in food justice, that work in keeping kids out of jail, helping the homeless, creating art and beauty, and connecting prisoners as they come out of jail with jobs and ways to make money, to have a home and a place where they can grow. Beyond that, Mission Gathering is a spiritual home and hub to all of those desperately want to follow Jesus in a way that is imaginative, that inspires hope, that illuminates love, and does all of the things that you've come to love about Mission Gathering. So this day of all days, can you give a gift of love to Mission Gathering? You'll see the links below you where you can give via your phone or online. All of your gifts are tax deductible. I know we're all thinking about taxes right now. And I just want to say thank you right now for your gifts, whether it's $5 or $500, whether it's a one-time gift or a recurring sustaining donation. Thank you so much. Let's pray. God, you've given us the ability to love each other. You allow us to give gifts to your church so that we can show love in a broader and more wider sense. Allow these gifts to work towards your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain, where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for three of the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, in whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around them, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9, the Common English Bible Translation. So there's a lot of things going on in this story today, right? It's filled with mystery that even the best speakers and scholars and theologians 
of time and history would have a hard time explaining fully because it's a mystery, right? But the author of Mark, right, the person who wrote this gospel, they were writing to real people, a real community, people like you and me. So rather than trying to spend too much time focusing on the metaphysical or explaining like how Jesus' clothes became like all shiny and bright or like where the heck Elijah and Moses were coming from, I want to read this passage and look into this passage like Mark was writing it to us. Like we were those people trying to, to get through the larger narrative and not just stay focused there. You see, the people reading Mark's gospel originally, they would have read the chapter beforehand. And they would have read in this previous chapter that Peter, right? Peter, the, the one who Jesus is, wouldn't heal his mother-in-law, the one who is always right by Jesus' side all, all throughout the gospels. That Peter, he correctly guesses that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus is happy about that. And he's like, yes, like God has revealed to you who I am. But then right after that, Jesus tells the disciples a really hard truth that the Messiah is going to have to die. And so Peter, being someone who loves and cares about Jesus, says, heck no, man, don't do it. We don't have to do that. I think you're mistaken. Let's go back and we'll reread through some prophecies and stuff and we'll sit down and we'll have a committee about it, Jesus. And then maybe, maybe you don't have to die. But Jesus, like, rebukes him hard. Jesus, like, throws some crazy amount of shade at him, even calling him the devil, right? So Jesus is clapped back at Peter. It just happened. And they're walking away from all that. And Jesus invites Peter, James, and John, just the three of them, plus Jesus, to go up the mountain with him. And so, like, quick Bible reading tip, if people are on top of a mountain, something important is about to happen. Moses, who appears, he got the Ten Commandments on top of a mountain and was shown God so clearly that he, he, his face shined brightly and they had to put a piece of cloth over it to make people stop being afraid of him. Elijah had had his like super like heavy metal battle with the prophets of Baal who challenged him to a bonfire contest and Elijah prayed and God threw fire down from the sky and consumed Elijah's bonfire and the prophets of Baal's bonfire. And so here are Peter, James, and John, and they're on top of this mountain. They're invited into this super important moment in Jesus' life. This moment of care and love that the heavenly parent is showing Jesus. And they're terrified. I mean, if we're honest, if you and I are honest with ourselves, we would have been terrified too, right? Like, you get invited to go on a hike, and all of a sudden a guy who led your ancestors out of Egypt, and the other guy, like we said, who called fire out of the sky and chopped dudes' heads off with axes, all of a sudden they just show up, and they're sparkling while Jesus is sparkling, and there's all this bright light. There's a cloud that's talking to you. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would have started to lose it a little bit myself. And Peter, poor Peter, who gets so much grief and his fear and nervousness, he responds in a way that we all know how to respond. He tries to pray off how afraid he is by letting Jesus know that it's, it's really great that Jesus has brought them here and everything's shining and crazy and out of this world. It's great, Jesus. And then out of his fear, he attempts to recreate something familiar. Have you ever been afraid? And all you want to do is recreate, good or bad, something that just feels familiar. He wants to build shrines on the mountain. And the Greek word here used for shrines is tabernacle. And if you're a Bible nerd like me or you went to Sunday school a lot, the tabernacle was a tent that the ancient Israelites worshipped God in before the temple was built. 
Because the tabernacle could go wherever God felt like going. It was free. But Peter wants to build them on this mountainside. Rather than being in this moment and understanding that God will go where God will go. And that this new movement, this new thing is not about creating a new Jerusalem, a new temple. That Jesus is the new temple. And Peter is trying, trying so desperately to keep that temple in place. To make sure it doesn't run away. To make sure it doesn't leave him. This moment isn't about Jesus. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the sermons, but this moment isn't about Jesus trying to prove he's legit to his besties. This moment's about God loving Jesus, about Jesus loving his friends enough to invite them along. The supernatural moments, they're not what's important, because like I said, this image that we have of the mountaintop and the tabernacle. It's a moment where the divine and the ancestral witnesses that have gone before Jesus bring comfort to him him as he marches towards death, as he marches towards the cross. Peter's not terrible for how he reacted. You and I do the same thing. Have you ever been really afraid? Have you ever been really afraid in that that terrible, limiting religion from your past comes back up because it's comforting? At least you have that structure. Have you ever wondered that 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 evangelical, fundamentalist, hateful, Christian nationalist agenda you walked away from, do you ever get scared and run back to it? Because you're afraid that God's going to judge you or something bad's going to happen. You see, we want to focus on the mountaintop. Right? This is where we get that idea of a mountaintop experience. It's from the Bible. We want to focus on the mountaintop. But Christianity, following Jesus, is to, to admit that you're afraid. Jesus is afraid. Jesus is afraid and he's wanting comfort and he doesn't want to have to go through this, but he knows that he has to go through this. Because following Jesus isn't about the mountaintops. Following Jesus is about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. In Mission Gathering, I know that the fear is all around us. And we see that the people who attacked our capital, the people who, who refused to move forward or to, to even give lip service to the term Black Lives Matter, those people live in fear. Fear that they're losing control. Feel that they are, fear that they're missing out on something. Fear that they have lost this power that they feel like is their God-given right. White Christian nationalism has always been about power. Because it's always been about fear. Fear of inadequacy. Fear of letting your family down. Fear of not being in control. Fear of not being in power. But Mission Gathering, Christianity, the following of Jesus, being a disciple of Christ is not about fear. It's about walking through that valley of the shadow of death and saying, I will fear no evil because Jesus said that those who love their lives will lose them, but those who lose their lives for the sake of others will gain them. Do you hear me, Mission Gathering? We have nothing to fear because even when we lose, we win. Even when we lose to the point of death on a cross, we win. Because it is not us who wins, but Christ in us who will do amazing things. As we go into this Ash Wednesday to reflect upon our death, it's scary. I've been facing my own mortality. Getting COVID will do that to you. You get super scared. But mission gathering, I do not 
fear. Because Jesus has walked through the valley of the shadow of death before me. He went up to the mountain, but he came down from that mountain. And he walked from that mountain up the hill of Calvary and he died. Not to pay a price I did not owe, but to show me that love will never give up. Love will never let go. Love will never push us aside. Love will go all the way into the most brutal forms of brutality that mankind can come up with mission gathering. So if you're tired, worn out, and burnt out on religion, come, come to the mountaintops that you need to get to to be refreshed. But this life, This life, all of it is a gift, whether it's the mountain or the valley. Because in each and every moment, Christ is resurrecting the way of love in your life. I wish you were here to say amen. The transfiguration does reveal to us Jesus is both divine and human. It reveals to us that God cares enough that God will enter solidarity with us. But it's not about it's not about staying on that mountaintop. It's about will you take up your cross and follow Him? Will you serve others? Will you devote your life to caring for yourself and caring for others? Will you give your heart to the power of love and let go of the toxic familiar of the past? No shrines, no tabernacles, but moving forward, one step after the other. We don't have to run. You don't need to run to Jesus. Following him one foot after the other so that you may be present in the gift of this life, that you may be holy, W-H, holy, human, and holy, divine, and Christ that lives within you. So may you not fear to leave the mountaintop and wrestle with what waits for you in the valley. May it be so. Jesus would walk down that mountain. He would walk down that mountain and back to Jerusalem. And the night before he was to be betrayed, betrayed to his death, he met with his friends for one last meal. And he gave the commandment to do this meal in remembrance of him. So that every time you eat, you'll break the bread as he broke the bread, saying, this is my body broken for you. Likewise, every time that we drink, we will give thanks, holding up the cup, saying, This is the love of God poured out for the world, the blood of Christ shed for you. So with whatever you have to eat or drink, break it. The bread of heaven, the cup of life, the body of Christ, the love of God, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Go now. Go now out into the world unafraid of what is to come next. Knowing that God is with you. That comfort is coming to you in ways and shapes that you don't expect yet. Remember to be kind to yourself and kind to others. To care for yourself and to care for others because that mission gathering is how we build the kingdom. So go forth in the blessings and the peace and covering of the God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of God, the Mother of us all. Amen. Happy Sunday.
Pain grows possibility. Um, pain makes you aware that something has to change. I think that, it, that if the body inherently was not sensitive to pain, the body would not know what needed to evolve, grow, change. I think it's when, so that's good. However, I believe that sometimes Humanity can allow phantom pain to impair its future possibilities. So phantom pain is when a person gets like a leg amputated and they have a dream that their the pinky toe on the, the left leg that was amputated like hurts. Like, oh shoot, the pinky toe on my left leg hurts. It's like, no, you don't have a left leg anymore. So I think it's when we allow the phantom pain that is no longer present to impair the possibility that that is uh, present. That's the problem with pain. But the possibility of pain is to make you aware that there is something calling you into a better space, a healthier space. Jesus, you know, is on the cross, is crucified, is actually nailed to the cross. And at that point of maximum disability, I mean, this is weakness at the heart of it all. At that point of maximum disability, he says, you know, mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, he forms a community from that point of maximum disability. And that's the community that is the, the essence of the church in John's gospel. You have to be utterly realistic about the darkness in our world, about the suffering, about the evil, about the terrible sin in ourselves, in other people. And you know, there's, you, you can't be superior about these things. You know you're part of it and you're, you're irrecon you know, it, it's just, it, it's unavoidable. You, you are part of it. It's only constant repentance every day. Um, but at the same time, there's joy. At the same time, there's resurrection, there's life, that, that, that Jesus is the last word, you know, and death is not the last word, evil is not the last word. And I think it's, it's how one lives in the present, in the spirit, on the basis that Jesus is the last word and that that involves both crucifixion and resurrection. Um, but of course also, community, utterly community, and you can only do it in community. And it was as if in that Kigali community of, of, um, of genocide survivors that uh, what you saw was how one person just can't do it, you know, that it has to be a community. It has to be a community supporting each other in, in, in this sort of thing, you know. The scapegoat mechanism started to be undone in elements, parts of the Hebrew scriptures as it began to become clear in some of the way they told stories that the victim was innocent, which is something that the group can't tell while it's in contagion. <laughs> and eventually that's right. ultimately demonstrated was in, blind. Yeah. in the, passion of, uh, the Passion of Christ, when the whole thing is just set out. This is what a lynch looks like. This is what it looks like when someone is falsely accused. This is what it looks like when people attempt to create their unity so as to save their nation <laughs> by casting someone out. And it's completely false. 
And then he says, uh, yep, uh, you did this to me, and guess what? I, I'm not holding it against you. Now let's see if you can start to be together another way. In other words, you're exactly right. The Eucharistic is the subversion from within. The what? The subversion from within of the sacrificial. There's, there's, there, there's, that, there's constantly renewed opportunities to surrender myself over to the trustworthy nature of what's happening to me. Whether you're in a hospice or hanging on a cross or sitting out on a bench, you know, cold. You know, just, so there's always just one thing going on. You have to go through pain for rebirth? Yes, you, yeah, well, we do go through pain. And through that pain, deeply surrendered to, we are reborn. And that's why I think, too, not to mystify this, as in, um, in other words, it, 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 it doesn't make us exempt from the human situation, but it delivers us into the incomprehensible stature of the human situation. But I'm, I went in once to see Thomas Merton for direction, and um, I was 18 years old, and I, I was complaining about something. I forget what it was. And he said to me, he said, we didn't come here to find a rarefied space free from the suffering of the world. We came here to carry the suffering of the whole world in our heart. See? I was really struck by that, that my suffering doesn't belong to me. And uh, so in my suffering, it unites me. You know? uh, compassion is the body of emptiness, as the Buddha say. So this Christ nature is that the, the, the infinite uh, presence of God and the most intimate interior places that hurt are one. You know, when I think about healing in particular, I can't think about healing without thinking about the concept of brokenness. And I think each of us has this experience in our life of experiencing rupture, whether that be rupture in relationship, rupture with God, rupture with ourselves. and. We have been so trained in our culture to step away from or view brokenness as a deficit. But it's my belief that it's in our brokenness that we can find truth. But there is something about the particularity of the experience of brokenness, I believe, that draws us closer to the divine and recognizing that there is something in one another that can move us closer to a more whole vision of the beloved community. So when I think about healing justice in particular, it is an invitation to folks to recognize and not be alone in their brokenness. We have fractured our human community where we are unable to to gather at the table across lines of difference so what does that look like when we bring really the constellation of differences to the dinner table and have a common meal isn't that the centrality of communion in the christian tradition right so what happens when we break bread with one another share this common practice i mean jesus never did say um bring a wafer and let's share a wafer. Jesus talked about a last supper. I think the reason that Jesus brought, asked us to, to come together around a table is because it's something that we, that we do every day. So, so it's not just um, some, some far off symbol, something that's outside of the norm, but you know, we're usually putting food in our face several times a day. And so th when you do that, remember, Jesus is saying, when you do that, remember how I've taught you to come together and share everything. You have to share everything. And when you share, you will be healed. In both the, the giving and the receiving, that's how you will be healed. Pain brought to speech turns to energy. Pain not brought to speech turns to violence. So if you take the, the liberation movements of uh, 
civil rights movement or feminism or uh, Matthew Fox. gay lesbian, Matthew Fox. Every one of them begins with the communal processing of pain that turns to energy. So and that, of course, that's, that's how the exodus begins. I was, I was taught in seminary that God takes all initiatives, but that's not how the exodus story starts. The exodus story starts out by saying they groaned and cried out, and their cry summoned God into the narrative. If they had not cried out, there'd have been no exodus. It's just, it, it is empirically true. And what the, em the empire doesn't mind if you have pain. The empire minds if you bring it to speech. <laughs>